Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Spencer Stewart. I'm, I'm the chair of the Alcuin Society. And uh, this evening, looking at some of the registrations, uh, we, we have some, uh, some returns. And, and in, that, in that case, uh, welcome back. And, and uh, thank you for coming for the uh, first session of 2022. We're really, uh, really excited to have Glenn uh, give a talk this evening. Um, but there's some, also some new names as well. So I want to take an opportunity now just to talk about the Alcuin Society and just some of the things that we we're involved in. Um, it was a society that was founded in, in 1965, and the Alcuin Society is the only nonprofit organization in Canada dedicated to the entire range of interests in the books and reading. Uh, we explore these topics through a variety of different uh, channels. So one of the first ones is Amphora, which is the society's journal. Uh, and that covers topics uh, that include authorship, publishing, uh, calligraphy, libraries, ephemera, book collecting, uh, you name it, really. It's the whole gamut, printing, illustration. Uh, we also cover it through, you know, we further our aims through other, uh, other things, such as the presentations that we're doing um, this year, the virtual presentations, as well as other in-person ones when those are, when those are possible. Uh, and then finally, through the Alcuin Society's annual awards for the excellence in book design in Canada. And it's the only national uh, competition of its kind that recognizes and celebrates uh, the art of the book in Canada. Uh, winners of this award go on to represent the nation in international exhibitions and competitions at Frankfurt and Leipzig uh, in, annually in, in Germany. And the society also offers the Robert R. Reed Award and Medal to recognize lifetime achievement in the book arts. Uh, now, if, if you are not a member of the society, we encourage you to visit our site and consider becoming one today. And um, as always, um, a, a, a hands go out and, and, uh, and a, a big thank you to uh, Gina Page, who's the program director for the Alcuin Society and is really the person who puts together uh, the various uh, speakers that we have, um, such as we have this evening. So really a, a fantastic job and we have a great lineup for 2022. We're just putting together the schedule in some cases, but we have some definite dates that uh, I'll make mention of at the end of the evening. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it on now to Paul Whitney for uh, the introduction this evening, and then uh, and, and I will leave it with him. Just one moment. And over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Spencer. Um, can I be seen? I'm not getting an image here on my screen. Yeah, you're good. Okay, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here this evening with my Alcon colleagues. And it's a, a particular pleasure to introduce my friend and fellow book collector at Glenn Woodsworth. Um, Glenn is a geologist by profession um, he is, um, he has a PhD from Princeton and has worked since graduating in, in Canada. Now, everything I know about geologists, I learned from a cab driver in Columbus, Ohio, when uh, a geology, a national geology conference had just been in town and he was a talkative guy. And he, um, he told me, he said, you know, the one thing I learned over the past week is there's only one thing you need to know about geologists. They're either field guys or they're desk guys. And that was the sexist nomenclature was his. But, um, and I thought about that and I said, well, that makes sense. And there's absolutely no question that, that Glenn is a field guy. He, he is not a guy that is chained behind the desk. And this seems just a little incongruous when it comes to somebody who is engaged in the rarefied, rarefied world of book collecting. So uh, Glenn um, has has been, I mean, is in fact an emeritus scientist with the, the government of Canada and had a distinguished career with um, the Geological Survey of Canada. Um, he, he's now uh, more perhaps more, more closely aligned with his book collecting in that he and his wife Joy um, have operate a sometime publishing company. Can I say, Glenn, I think a total of 10, 10 publications overall. 
and that's uh, Tricuni. Um, perhaps most notable again for book lovers is that they published in 1998, uh, Cheap Sons of Bitches, the uh, publications of William Hoffer. And those of you that don't know that from whence the title comes, it's a quote from Kenneth Rexroth, the American poet, who said he'd had it with people who say they love poetry and never buy any. And Hoffer was sort of, that's very much in line with how Hoffer viewed the world. So um, other notable books that Tricuni has published in the years, perhaps most, most notably is Vancouver City on the Edge, Living with a Dynamic Geological Landscape, uh, by Clegg and Turner, and that's more in line with, with Glenn's um, training and, and so on. He, in, personally, apart from his own publishing and endeavor, uh, has been a regional best-selling author with his book, The Hot Springs of Western Canada, which has been through three editions, is currently um, out of print, and uh, hopefully we'll see that come back sometime soon. Um, we are here tonight because of Glenn's activity as a book collector. And um, specifically, he's going to talk about his Malcolm Lowry collection. But I think it just it behooves us all to, to remember that this is just one aspect of his, his, um, his, his personality, his background, his interests. Um, but I think he really he devotes himself to his collecting as he does the rest of his endeavors. And he does uh, just a great job with it. And it's not just Lowry. He may talk a bit about some of his other collecting as well. Uh, perhaps Glenn's most public moment um, has, was when in 2012, uh, the Haida Gwaii earthquake. And the, it appeared that the uh, hot springs up there was in peril. And Glenn was quoted on, on the front page of the Vancouver Sun as the expert on would it come back and um, it's what's notable about this was this was during the sort of the previous government, uh, and there were sensitivities around um, civil servants, apparently even in retirement, uh, speaking to the press. So Glenn, Glenn got reprimanded for making a statement on the hot spring without going through the government press people, uh, which I just is one, I guess, indicator of the absurdity of government sometimes or some governments anyway. But uh, I think that that's beside the point at this stage. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Glenn and hearing about his collecting passion, which is uh, primarily Malcolm Lowry, although, as I said, not exclusively. So at this point, I'm happy to hand it over to Glenn. Share a screen here. Turn on this thing. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Stuart. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Malcolm Lowry and how I got involved with collecting him and a few places has taken me in, a few stories, and some of the stuff in my collection. I'm not going to show you everything that I have or would be here all night, and it's going to bore people silly. So. Um, that's it. Now, can people see this? I'm having some trouble here. Let's move this over here. Uh, can people see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks good, Glenn. I started my teens. Uh, I come from a family of readers, and I'm in a family of readers, and our kids read it voraciously. Joy reads voraciously, so do I, we all do. And I started collecting uh, uh, science fiction paperbacks. It was all I could afford as a teenager. And by, by people like Phil Dick and William Burroughs, and not William Burroughs, but Ursula Gwynn and anybody else in there. And I really liked the covers on these Ace books. These were 35 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents. And it went up a bit from there. And I just liked this stuff. And I said, hey, I better collect a few of these things. So I did. So that was maybe when I was 15 or 14 or something. I can't remember, something like that. And I, and I still have a big shelf of these things downstairs, so I got to organize someday. So um, my parents didn't like me collecting these things. They thought this stuff was junk, uh, just pure trash. And why wasn't I reading something more edifying like um, one of the classics? Well, I read the classics too, but um, 
but I really like these things. But that had nothing, of course, to do with Malcolm Lowry. So in the summer of 63, I was working for a mining company uh, on the west coast of the island. And another person on this party was a guy by the name Bill New. And one day I came up to him and said, what's new, Bill? Which he'd heard a hundred times already that summer. Um, he said, I'm reading a book by this guy by the name Malcolm Lowry. It's called Under the Volcano. And uh, you might like it. We talked a lot about books and reading. And uh, I said, what's it about? He said, well, it's actually, uh, it's about the last day in the life of a complete, absolute um, alcoholic. It's the last day in his life for, you know, when he dies of alcoholism and other things. So I said, that sounds depressing. He said, no, actually, it's pretty funny. Uh, it's pretty funny and it's quite deep. And you might want to look it up. So I filed that away. And uh, Bill actually just, he went on to his own career as a prof, an English prof at UBC. Um, don't know what his specialty was, but he wrote some soft things in Lowry, including this quite good reference guide, which came out in 74, something like that. Uh, so he's a Lowry scholar too. And he also did the wonderful uh, Encyclopedia of Canadian Literature. Anyway, I went home at the end of the summer and my dad was reading this thing in New World Writing uh, called The Forest Path to the Spring by this guy by the name of Malcolm Lowry. And uh, so we were talking. He said, oh, you might like this thing. It's, uh, it's set in, it's set in uh, Deep Cove, Dollarton area. And uh, it's very, uh, it's quite lyrical and it's quite, uh, it's quite uplifting. And so it's not at all depressing or anything. And so I said, okay. So I read that and I read Under the Volcano and I was hooked from then on. Of course, I didn't have any money and, uh, in those days. And when I was married, we had two kids and I was on, uh, on a student salary, student stipend and things like that. And so all I could afford was cheap paperbacks and stuff. But I, I did know Bill Hoffer and Vancouver bookseller of, um, uh, who's well known. And he thought that he thought that Larry was over vastly overrated, and he, he was going to fade away to nothing. And uh, but he, and so he didn't really he looked down his nose at me for collecting Lowry, but he was always willing to sell stuff to me, um, mostly minor stuff, which I would have found anyway, but not entirely. So and he was he was great help to me in guiding me through early days of collecting stuff. I was a little more serious collecting, and he taught me a lot about buying and selling books and uh, the way the, the book collecting industry works. He was a very generous person in my, in my particular opinion. And there's other booksellers who have helped too. I don't want to mention them because I'm going to forget some, but mostly, mostly here in British Columbia, Canada, one or two have been very helpful online. And uh, so thank you to all of them. So the book which he's known for, of course, uh, is the last published book which he did. Um, in his lifetime under the volcano. That's one which my friend Bill Neal was reading um, at that time. And it went through, in New York, it went through three printings in a book club edition. Came out the same year from Jonathan Cape in London and it sold like dog poo. It didn't sell at all. Uh, the reviews weren't very good. The American reviews and the Canadian reviews were good, um, but uh, mostly really good actually. Oh, well, there's one quite critical one. But the British reviews were lukewarm, despite the fact Lowry was a Britisher. He was born near Liverpool and went to Cambridge and so forth. So I happen to have a proof of the British one of this. Uh, these are very rare. There's only one, one other I can find in a library in England. And I put this in because you can see down here, perhaps you can see his monogram DMS with this, which I presume is either a butterfly or a fishnet. And you can see the open book here. And this had belonged to a guy by the name of Silverman, who was a, a Teamsters guy, I think in Chicago, uh, but I could be wrong on that. Um, he was trying to organize uh, a chain of bookstores in Chicago, I think it was. And somebody said, well, you know, he was talking with somebody there and he said, you know, so he said, you know, the, the people actually buy this stuff, these used books, secondhand books. Does anybody buy this stuff? And so he said, oh yeah, people pay big money for some of these things. And so Silverman's eyes perked up and he, talked to some dealers, I think in New York State and New York City and said, uh, I've got the money I want to put it into books. I've heard they might go up in value. So what do you suggest I collect? So the, these guys said, um, these guys said, well, you can collect James Joyce or, or, or William Faulkner. Those are the two people that I think are going to go way up. And if you want to broaden a bit, you can go to the, the Anthony Burgess list of 
uh, Burgess 99 or whatever it's called, uh, the 99 best books published before 1950 in the English language, which Under the Volcano was on. Anyway, Silverman ran into difficulties when he got involved in some corruption or mixed up in something, something to do with lawyers and uh, big time fees and courts and maybe jail time, I'm not sure. So his collection got disbanded and I was lucky to snag this thing later on. So most of his writing was published after his death. And I find a lot of the stuff to be all worth the effort, but they, most people don't. Volcano is it as far as they're concerned. But for collecting, I find his really early stuff to be more interesting and to, more difficult to find than, than the stuff that came out after his, after his lifetime. Um, he, he went to a school in Cambridge called the Lays or the Lees um, when he was a teenager. And that's where his first published stuff appeared starting when he was 15. He was born in 1909 and he started showing up with these things. He was already drinking at this time and on his way to becoming an alcoholic. And he signed his stuff Camel with his edition CML sometimes, which stood for his, stood for his uh, just his initials, that's all it was. He never used the term Clarence. And I don't know what his parents were doing, saddling him with Clarence uh, as a first name. Um, at all. But this, this is where he published quite a bit of stuff during his years there. When he went to Cambridge, he was studying literature, and he, there are two good undergrad magazines there. One, The Venture, edited by Michael Redgrave, the actor, and Jacob Brunowski and other people. And the other by an interest by Gerald Knox, who became a friend of his. Knox eventually, after graduation, moved to Canada and wound up working for CBC Radio doing radio plays. Uh, for many, many years in the 40s and the 50s. And you can see who he's got on here. He's got Jacob Bronowski, who was an undergrad at the time, uh, but he's got, uh, he's got James Joyce, an unpublished thing by Joyce showed up here. Malcolm Lowry and of course himself and other people. Um, they, had, they had really good material in those things. Lowry fell in with uh, uh, a literary circle that once in a while in the evenings. Uh, run by a woman by the name of Charlotte Haldane, who was the wife of the eminent biologist J.B.S. Haldane um, uh, at Cambridge. And like many of uh, her friends, um, the Haldanes were Marxists. They were uh, supportive of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War is a theme that runs throughout much of Lowry's writings uh, at all. And uh, to date, nobody has published too much on the Marxist implications of Lowry's stuff but they will. Um, and uh, the novel is dedicated to Lowry. It's based on Lowry's life at, at her knowledge of Lowry as a person. So it's a portrait of Malcolm. And it's got song like lyrics, which are actually credited on the copyright page to Lowry. So it's a real Lowry item. And uh, the thing, the, and Charlotte's book came out in 1932. And I don't think it's ever been reprinted. And the thing is scarcer than hen's teeth in any condition and let alone in a pristine dust jacket like that. When I ordered this thing online, then uh, somebody, uh, it was all done by, yeah, it was done by email. And anyway, the person said, what do you want this for? Nobody's ever heard of this person. And they certainly don't read her and anymore. So anyway, when the book arrived and I saw what it was, I emailed back and said, it turns out to be a Malcolm Lowry item. And they were both in uh, Cambridge. And he said, oh, I'll keep my eyes open. So. Uh, and it was dirt cheap. So his first novel was based on a sea voyage, which he took. He worked as a deckhand, I think, on a freighter, which went to, went to China and back in, uh, in the 20s, late 20s. Uh, and this book uh, was published by Jonathan Cape, the people who published later published Under the Volcano. And it didn't sell very well. And it got remaindered and stuff like that. The dust jacket here is not wonderful. I keep trying to upgrade, but uh, trying to find anything, uh, any cops of this with dust jacket at all uh, is very, very difficult, unless you want to go into five figures. So this, this book was greatly influenced by Blue Voyage, a novel by Conrad Aiken, an American writer who was a mentor to Lowry and ultimately I think an evil influence on Lowry. And uh, they, they, I think they pretended to bring out the worst in each other to a certain extent. Um, but uh, Aiken was about 20 years older and was a huge influence on Lowry. 
parts of this book are always pastiche from that. They're also pastiche from the Nordahl Greek book published in the 20s in uh, Norway and translated into English. And I think also there's a parallels with, uh, with this book, They Die Young by, by Malcolm's friend and drinking companion, John Summerfield, um, who was about the same age as him. They Die Young, and again, it's based on a nautical voyage where Summerfield uh, uh, spent some time on there as a deckhand. Maybe it's a thing to do in the early 30s, late 20s. There's not, certainly nothing else to do in the early 30s. So um, I think those are the influences on, on uh, Ultramarine. This is one of my prize items. Um, it's a proof of this thing. Not known, nobody's seen the thing. Um, nobody's seen it anywhere. Uh, Lowry's bibliographer did not have it. Biographers have never heard of this thing at all. And uh, I haven't pressed followed up with Kate, but I understand their records are in sad disarray. The nice thing about this is it's got textual differences from, from the actual published book. So it's earlier uh, than that. And uh, they're not just copy editing things uh, at all. They're actual textual changes where I think Lowry has uh, made changes to it and uh, revised it to some extent. So I've got, to, I've got to do some work on this, document these changes. And there's some things I have to go down to the Huntington Library in California to look at something they have, but not one of these things. So I'm very proud of this thing and it doesn't exist. You see it here and now you don't. So, um, he met his first wife, Jan Gabriel. She was an American uh, and they were traveling. They traveled around Spain a bit. They lived in the US for a bit, which is her home country, New York, and eventually Mexico where they stayed for a while. And he worked on two novels there. And he only published a few short stories. He was writing hard. Uh, and here's one on board the West Hardaway, which eventually showed up as part of Ultramarine in a different version. Uh, in, the story, in the American Story Magazine. It's his first publication um, uh, outside of the UK. They split up in 1937, he and Jan did, and Malcolm moved to Vancouver, where he, and he married his second wife, Marjorie Bonner. She was from LA and an aspiring actress. And she did a fair bit parts in some flicks in the 20s, I think, and 30s. But they, they eventually settled, settled down in the shack in Dollarton here. And uh, the cover picture here is on Cheryl Saloom's book. Uh, and it's a, a painting by, can't remember, um, of, their, of their shack. Um, and in, uh, in sitting in the mud flats in Dollarton, where they were. They had several shacks there, but this was the one there. And in 1941, the shack burned down and they were, most of their stuff, most of their possessions were lost and Volcano was saved but not the other novel he was working on, which was called In Ballast to the White Sea, another reference to a sea voyage there. But they rebuilt, they stayed there, and they, they made some really good friends there. Um, and not only among the beach people, but also uh, with people like Earl Burney and Dorothy Livesey, I think. And they're probably the best years and the happiest years and probably the most productive years of his life. The book, by the way, by Cheryl, uh, she documents all the stuff, the time he spent in Vancouver, place he lived, bars he hung out in, uh, the people he met and all this stuff. And it's a really good, really good, uh, really good book in its own right. It's an interesting read. So, so under the volcano appeared and around the same time, he got some sorts, she got some poems placed in various magazines, British and American, um, Earl Burney's uh, Canadian poetry, contemporary verse, uh, which was, Ran for quite a while. It was edited by a guy out of Caulfield, Blind, I believe. But you can see here he's got here Anne Marriott, A.J.M. Smith, Irving Layton, Roy Daniels, Malcolm Lowry, and others in there um, as well. And then in England, uh, by uh, uh, in Arena, uh, the first two issues of that, uh, which uh, which has got uh, Angus Wilson and it's got Nobel Prize winner Pablo Neruda, some poetry by him, alongside poetry by Malcolm here. But you know, he continued to drink and Marjorie was an alcoholic too. So they left for, they left uh, Dollarton and Vancouver for good and they eventually settled in England. He considered himself though a Canadian, but he never was. He tried to enlist in the war, but the army wouldn't have anything to do with him. So they eventually settled in the South of England where he eventually died at the age of 47. And, and this uh, here, these three issues here are the three issues of Esprit magazine, which serialized the last thing published in his lifetime uh, which was a novella called Lunar Caustic. 
which eventually appeared in English under that title and uh, uh, eventually has worked out various versions of it and had a scholarly edition come out just a few years ago. But this is a little bit like Oscar Wilde where Salome was first published in French and then translated in English. And the same thing happened with Lunar Caustic. His wife Marjorie was a, was a bit of a writer too and she had three novels published. This one is the most interesting and if not least because it's as similar as with Volcano. It, it has nothing like a psychological depth or the layering of illusions or, or the piling on of, of um, literary references on and on. Uh, but it shows that the two were working side by side, not on each other's manuscripts, but they were obviously talking. And in both books, the main female character is killed by a runaway horse. I like this cover with the little woman here with the giant horse and a much bigger man here. Uh, my wife thinks the man has sort of a, uh, it looks like a, uh, something out of, the, out of the Stalinist years, the cover does. I don't quite see it, but uh, looks a bit young adultish to me, but be it as it may. Um, the astronomical symbols, you can see in Marjorie's book here, you've got the Big Dipper, uh, that, and Pegasus, uh, the constellation Pegasus, uh, the horse, and of course Orion, and uh, the Pleiades show up in both books. And that's what Marjorie's doing. She knew far more about the night sky than Malcolm did. And the book was dedicated to her, as was her first mystery. But her second mystery is, is the real winner here, I think, of these things. Um, they were traveling when the proofs came, so they never saw the proofs. But Scribner's, as it turned out, had lost the last signature of the thing, the last pages of the manuscript. And it's a murder mystery, so they published it without the last chapter, which I think is a no-no in murder mysteries, because you want to find out who did it. And here it just says that that's something appeared in Rise, and that's it. Somebody's confessing, but he didn't do it. So uh, when they got back and saw the book six months later, they were furious. And... Uh, and Scribner's eventually wrote Marjorie and said, well, what we can do is we'll, we'll, re we we'll reprint the thing, which they didn't, but they print up a number of signatures of the last page, of the last chapter, and sort of glued them into the, the existing, what stock they had left of the book, uh, and sold those if they could, and, uh, or remained with them or whatever happened. So you can see here that it ended, the previous one ended page 190, and we are in page 191. And it goes on to page one of 204. So if you're looking for this book, find the one with page 204, because uh, all the copies on for sale and have been for years all have um, uh, all have only 190 pages in them. And the 204 one is very, very scarce. This one I got courtesy of Bill Hoffer, and he sold it to me rather than UBC, which is very nice. But Lowry just, you know, somehow he couldn't work uh, very well. Uh, he didn't like the celebrity thing. He had to do a bit of a tour and he went to New York and he didn't like that, uh, you know, at all. He liked the shack and Dollarton there and the beach people there that he liked. And he just kept drinking heavily and slowly he fell off the, off the map. He had some contracts with publishers and, but he couldn't honor it with his advances, but he couldn't write anything. He couldn't produce anything that was acceptable to them. So, um, although he wrote voluminously, um, but he couldn't really finish anything. But since that time, there's been all the stuff that's come out. And during all these harder years, between uh, volcano years and when he was in obscurity at his death, some of his friends, many of his friends stuck by him, Cambridge people, some of his friends from Dollarton and Marjorie, they all stayed by him. But they all found him very difficult, and he and Marjorie found each other difficult. Here's an association copy from a friend of his, uh, uh, Jimmy Stern, uh, a writer that uh, that they were friends from the 30s on in England, and Stern moved to New York and worked out in New York. To Dorothy and Harvey Burt, who were friends of them in Dollarton, in memoriam Melk, Jimmy Stern, and this is inscribed the year that um, the year that Larry died, probably when Jimmy found out about this about his death. The best of the later novels. Uh, I think it's October Ferry to Gabriola, Gabriola Island, of course, off near Nanaimo. It went through uh, a couple of editions. Um, the, the Dust Jack in the second edition doesn't have this ugly crinkling on it, but this is actually the first printing Dust Jack. So if you see one without the crinkling, it's a second, it's a second printing Dust Jack in the thing. It's quite a good novel, novel, like a lot of his BC stories are. He was calm at the time, he was at peace with himself 
and at peace with the world. And, and it's quite, I think, um, quite lyrical and it's quite upbeat, I think. Uh, starting about 1960, Basil Stewart Stubbs, librarian at UBC, said this guy is probably worth collecting and started uh, the Malcolm Lowry Special Collection, Malcolm Lowry Collection at UBC Special Collections. And he hired a young librarian, Anne Yandel, who some of you would have known. And uh, uh, she read, uh, she said she read uh, Volcano, and then she read it again and again, and it finally started dawning on her. And she became, like me, addicted to him. And uh, she built she built a fantastic collection. She was like a bulldog. If she heard that you had a manuscript or a letter or something that she didn't have, she'd, she'd be after you to donate it to the library. And if you're unwilling to donate it, she'd be trying to raise money to buy it from you. So she's got an amazing collection. She built up this amazing collection. And I first met her at a Lowry conference and uh, she made me feel very welcome in the, in the Lowry community. Uh, a lot of scholars and people like that, not too many collectors, but she made me an amateur in the field of English literature. Um, my doctorate is not in English literature, it's in, it's in earth sciences, um, but she made me feel very welcome. And uh, she would occasionally come over to our place in the evenings and we'd sit there in our living room and have a glass of wine and just chat about stuff. Or we'd go over there and take the dog for a walk and just pop in and have, uh, have a drink with her and come home. She lived close to us. And uh, Joy and I really miss her and many people here, including people on this conference call will con continue to miss her too, I know. But because of Anne's uh, determination, there's not much Malcolm Lowry manuscript material that's, uh, that's escaped her clutches or escaped the clutches of other librarians. It's very scarce. Uh, I've got a couple of pieces. The letter up here from 1930 uh, ends there. So I'm now famous or I will be 1931. You can sell this letter, uh, Malcolm, in his, in his handwriting. And eventually whoever had this letter, I don't know who, did, did sell it. And then there's manuscript here with which he has corrected. It's a was the start of a an article on him in Canada. And you can see he's got stuff running up and down the pages and, and it's impossible to read his handwriting there. And accompanying this particular one, there's a wonderful letter from his mentor and nemesis, Conrad Aiken which goes into quite good detail about Malcolm and their relationship and about Malcolm's personality and so forth. Um, I, I'm very lucky to have that. Obviously, I got these after Anne retired, or they'd be at UBC. The things which elude me are the sheet music. Um, they, he and the, in the teens, he and a friend, um, Ronald Hill published, Vanity published two, two pieces of sheet music, probably paid for by Malcolm's father, um, you know, the type of thing you could pay the publisher and they print up a hundred copies of these things, and, but they wouldn't distribute them. It wasn't featured with great success by Alfredo uh, at all, but if you paid uh, the publisher, rather, uh, if you paid uh, Alfredo, uh, could get his name on this Vandy Press stuff for a few pounds going to the publisher and to say that they featured the stuff, but Alfredo probably never, and his band probably never played this particular music. Um, there are, are, are copies around, uh, but I've, they've completely eluded me and I've gone through thousands of pages of dead sheet music from the, from the 20s, 30s, and I can't find it, nor can other people are looking for it. So if you have one, you want to sell me one or two of these things, uh, we can talk. Um, Earl Burney plays quite a few poems uh, after Laura's death and uh, uh, in various literary magazines, mostly little magazines. The one in the upper left, by the way, looks like a piece of Robert Bringer's typography to me, uh, a bit with a stylized X up there, which is the name of the magazine, and, and with the names going down like that. Um, but uh, he managed to place these. They didn't pay much for these, and the money went to Marjorie, who had fallen on hard times. The UC Library Quarterly had an article by Earl, I think, with a poem in it, too. Uh, Earl and uh, Marjorie eventually took the best of the poems, edited them somewhat, perhaps badly, and uh, put them out by, in this publication by City Lights Books out of San Francisco, better known for Ferlinghetti uh, and uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg's Howell. But this book, oddly enough, has stayed in public, public through the stayed in publication through the years, uh, most for the most part. And there's a new edition came out a few years ago, 2016, with a different cover on it, but it's the same book. 
uh, a friend of mine was asked if anybody reads this guy anymore. Did he, what's his influence? Did he have any influence? Like everybody knows Joyce had a huge influence and uh, other people and Conrad and Melville and uh, all of whom, by the way, influenced Lowry very much. But Lowry had a big influence too. And uh, here's three, uh, I picked three BC examples here. Audrey Thomas and the best of these I think is, uh, is by uh, uh, Meredith Quartermain who with her husband, uh, Peter, uh, are in the Alpine Society and uh, ran Slug Press for many years doing, doing the really nice broadsides and really nice work. This, this one by her is a good book and I recommend it. And the same with poetry. He had, he had a huge influence for poems. Uh, there's poems based on some of his work in German. There's some based in Spanish and I think French as well, um, aside from uh, things. And so they, they've, they've used these things. Now this is by Sharon Thiessen and it's, it's got an in your face Ferris wheel here. And the Ferris wheel figures very prominently in Under the Volcano if you've read the book. And so this is just a rub it in your face that is really about this stuff. And it's about, um, um, it's about the, the, the twin demons and loves of Malcolm, which are alcohol and, and his writing and in later years and his inability to write. There are some radio ad adaptations, including one in England, uh, a couple in the CBC, I think. And uh, uh, eventually some of these plays were put out here by um, University of Ottawa. They're published in this uh, black on white book here, um, there. And uh, there's also these two plays bookmarking uh, either side of it. And this one on the left is uh, by an imaginary Lowry in his 60s probably, and, a, and an Aiken in his 80s in a wheelchair. And they're sitting over a couple of bottles um, going over their life and their influences and what they did and things like that. Um, uh, Aiken was an alcoholic too. And uh, the, the interesting lines in this is late in the, in the play, Malcolm says to Conrad, he says, you know, 50 years from now, I'm gonna be the one they remember and nobody's gonna remember you. You had the Pulitzer Prize and all the awards and things, and you published way more than I did, and got way more notice, but your work is gonna fade away, it's not gonna last. Mine is gonna last, and that's what's happened. Uh, and Charlotte Cameron's play has got Lowry and his two wives, and I think Aiken in it, in an imaginary senior, senior imaginary senior, uh, scenario in this play, which was produced, I think, on Gabriel Island. Good, good one too. There's a film, of course, um, it's, it's okay, but you can't really film the thing. It's all interior monologue, a great deal of it is. Uh, nothing happens to the thing, except that the hero dies and, and the heroine dies. Um, so nothing, nothing happens really. So it's interior monologue, but John Houston did the best he could with the thing and it's not bad, but the documentary by Donald Britton on the left, National Film Award, I think is better. Talks about his, his life and his death and the book. And this one too, uh, talking about uh, with uh, John Houston and others, uh, talking about the, the making of the movie, I think is more interesting too. But he loved jazz, Malcolm did. He loved jazz, early jazz, um, very much and couldn't get enough. He played, played the ukulele and he played pretty well actually. Um, so, I've, so I've been told. So the, the British uh, jazz musician, Graham Collier, put out two, uh, two, two vinyl records of uh, jazz um, in, the, in the 70s, Day of the Dead and The Forest Path to the Spring, which was the title of that novella, which my father was reading for me many years ago. And uh, I think Malcolm would have liked this music very, very much. But there's much, much more. I, I mentioned this one because it has a Vancouver connection. Lost Guild is a, is a Vancouver um, composer. And here, this was done by a, a Welsh publisher. They took some copies of Lunar Caustic, the novella that was published late and eventually came up by Penguin. And bound into this thing is a small CD with a, a electronic music uh, based on the novella. The electronic stuff isn't really to my taste. Uh, and I don't think Larry would have liked it much either. But there's much, much more music based on Larry, including a really nice album of songs sung in French by a French singer uh, uh, to translations of some of Lowry's poetry that came out 2002, something like that. The same with art. I can't begin to touch the artwork here and I'm not confident on that. Uh, I'll just mention Alberto Giranella, a Mexican artist. 
he had uh, exhibits uh, at the, in at the 90s in Spain and in Paris, and this is the catalog for the for the French uh, exhibit here. On the left, you can see the volcano there, of course. You can see the horse, which features in uh, um, in, in under the volcano, and you can see mezcal here, which of course was Lowry's um, drink of doom, so to speak. Um, but there's so much more, and I can't I can't mention any more. There's also a huge literature on Lowry, almost in the industry, if you want. Uh, it's died down a bit, but uh, because some of the people have got older and retired and things, but there's all sorts of stuff on them. And I, I actually collect, I actually read the stuff and uh, I actually enjoy most of it because I'm familiar with the subject matter that I, I can actually follow it mostly. But it's been all sorts of books, articles, you name it. Symposia, this is for the last, the latest symposium, one of the latest, which was held in Liverpool, the place of Malcolm's birth, uh, 70 years after the publication of Under the Volcano. And I was lucky enough to attend that. Big biographies and uh, on it goes. Uh, just a couple of these things. The Malcolm Larry newsletter ran in Ottawa for 50 issues for quite a long time. Uh, started off as this cheap mimeograph thing, turned into something a little more professionally produced and uh, got all sorts of stuff, articles, you name it. What happened to people he knew and everything else, book reviews, on it goes. Um, and lately we've had, uh, oops, we've had the Firminist published out of Liverpool, um, there by Liverpudlians. There we can see Malcolm Larry Goldnail here. And again, it's got articles of Malcolm and stories and things like that. Uh, nothing by him, poetry, uh, riffing on Lowry stuff, fiendishly hard crossword puzzles, um, articles about Liverpool, places where Lowry lived there, and so forth like that. Um, it's been about five or six issues. I haven't seen one for a few years. Books. David Markson was a friend of Lowry's and knew him, and he wrote a master's thesis, which somebody eventually persuaded him to turn into a book. And it was sort of the first book-length study of Lowry's Under the Volcano, and remains probably one of, one of, the, one of the most interesting, one of the best. And uh, one of the most recent ones, not the first, one of the most recent ones, was by my British friend, Nigel Foxcroft, uh, on, uh, on Lowry's whole output, trying to tie it all together, looking at the, looking at the shamanistic and the uh, spiritual and the esoteric influences in there. And, and not just in English, like most people do, but he looked at, he looked at some of the German uh, expressionists. Uh, he looked at the Russian people, people like uh, P.D. Uspensky and George Kirchief. He looked at some of the Americans, people like uh, uh, Charles Fort and the Fortians and those those sorts of quacks, if you ask me, and uh, Charles, Charles, I think Donnelly, and many other people of this sort, uh, aspects that, he, that nobody else had looked at. He tries to tie the whole thing together in here. You can see the cover here, the dead dog, which figures in uh, under the volcano very much. Mezcal again showing up here on this and the various cantinas along the way in Mexico. It's a, it's a good book. I think it's one of the best and most original of the recent piece of Lowry scholarship. I can't mention all this stuff. I'll finish with three other things. These things, you can read them here. The Blue Coat uh, in Liverpool, uh, which I placed there public times. Uh, they put on, every year they put on, uh, have an evening, a Malcolm Lowry evening with, with various things to do with Lowry readings and stuff. There's a punk group in Germany called Malcolm Lowry. There's a, uh, the Lighthouse Invites the Storm was Lowry's, um, Intended uh, title for his collection of poems never got published, and that turned into a pretty interesting multimedia thing. Uh, and I got to mention Cheryl Grace's at UBC, her uh, wonderful collection of 800 letters of Lowry, some of them up to 30 pages long, um, which she tried to pull everything together here, annotate these things. It's a masterpiece. And it's one of the great pieces of Lowry scholarship. And Lowry was with question, without question, a great letter writer. And even when he couldn't really work on his fiction and really couldn't work on his own work, he found time to write to other people and write very long, penetrating letters. He could still write, um, write pretty amazing letters. I just can mention three things here at the end and I'm gonna shut up. Uh, the Lowry's got deported from Mexico in 46. And he wrote a novel based on this, which eventually got 
piece together. And uh, it's not very interesting, but it's based on their experience of the deportation. And uh, in 1998, um, this pirated section of the thing came out and it's got dollar and flats for the publication here, which is not, it was actually published in uh, Ontario. Uh, I won't say by who. And the Colophon recent part, 10,000 copies of this issued in the spirit of bringing the Quetzal home to roost uh, by one can suggest that test that things haven't changed much in Mexico. You still have to bribe, uh, the officials are still corrupt and on it goes and you're still gonna get bogged down in everything. Uh, so you think 10,000 copies, how come I haven't seen this thing? And well, it turned out, it turned out that's the colophon. There are 23 copies printed only, uh, of which this is one. And most of them, uh, the publisher uh, or the pirate, whatever, however you want to look at it, sent to various Mexican embassies in the United States and Canada. So where they probably no doubt got trash, tossed in the trash as soon as some, somebody read it. Now this book, what's this doing here? This is Victorian poetry mostly, and Rupert Brooke, a, a dreadful amount of Kipling, and Tennyson, and um, and and worse, uh, still in there, mainly Victorian era stuff, uh, by some Victorian general here, published during the Second World War. Paper was in short supply here um, at this time. This book came out probably, and it actually went into a couple of editions probably and got sent off to, to the troops to try to inspire the troops. Uh, I don't recall too much um, Wilfred Owen uh, in here, but there's certainly Rupert Brooke and other people. Owen, I think, was a bit too down for the times. So let's look at the dust jacket here, if this works. Pardon the background noise. It's a copy of Ultra Marine Jacket. Yeah, now turn on, show the other side. There it is. And, and apparently during the Second World War, paper was in short supply. Uh, publishers were pulping uh, all sorts of remainders and stuff that was not selling. And Jonathan Cape, who published this book and had published Ultramarine and Volcano, uh, said, well, we got the, the book Ultramarine didn't sell and we had to remainder it and pulp it. So, but we still got the shelf full of these jackets. So let's use these jackets, just print them in something else and uh, a few copies of this book. Uh, so that's how that came about. And I was lucky to find this. And every time one of these things comes up on the internet, I, I email the person who's selling it and say, what's on the inside of the dust jacket? And they always write back and say, nothing, it's white. Why do you ask? So I've never seen another one of these things. It's an oddity and I'm happy to have it. The last thing I want to mention is is this one out of Mexico. Now Mexico has turned into quite a hotbed for Lowry scholars and Lowry studies these days. And this is published by a publishing company called La Cartanera uh, out of Cuernavaca in Southern Mexico where Lowry lived. This one came out in 2018. And uh, uh, it's results of, of proceedings of a conference there, um, which um, are mostly in Spanish. So a couple of people, my friend Nigel's got a thing in here, I think in English. But uh, the interesting thing is what they did was each cover here is hand painted. So each one of the 120 copies of a producer of this has got a different cover on. Each one is hand painted by, by a Cuernavacan artist. Let's look at the back. Oops, here we are. The back is cardboard and the whole thing is cardboard. And it's called La Cartanera uh, for a reason. Um, the publishing company, they buy cardboard from dumpster divers in effect. They pay them triple, they say, what they would get at the paper recycling place. And they cut it up and use it for book covers. Um, nothing fancy here. There's been a whole bunch of the thing that was in probably in the original box, uh, which the Kimberly Clark toilet paper, whatever it came from, Kim wipes probably there. And they, they just bound them up like this. So it's the farthest thing you can imagine from fine binding, or is it to me? I think it's very fine and to me, there's a lot more passion and spirit that goes into this than some of the very dead uh, fine press, letterpress stuff that is beautifully and immaculately done, but it has no soul to it. And uh, uh, you know, compared with this thing, which is done by amateurs, done by a group of impassioned uh, people uh, in Mexico. So I'm gonna keep on with this clacking. I'll never get uh, to the end, of course. Uh, so I think Bill Hoffer was wrong 
um, about Lowry's stature. I think it's high. And uh, whether it's high with the general reading public, he's not harlequin romance material or popularity, um, or even much better writers. But uh, but he's he's a better writer and his stuff will, will live, a volcano will. And I've had a great deal of pleasure out of this collection and not the least of which are the friendships which I had made with uh, other Lowry scholars and other Lowry lovers. And, and I think that's it. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. So thank you. Fantastic, Glenn, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions for Glenn, please uh, do not hesitate to type them in the uh, in the chat. Um, I have a question just right off the bat from uh, relating to that last item you were showing, uh, which you know is is obviously a, a book object uh, in a way, but also engages with you know cardboard and other materials and things. Um, are, are there other sort of non are there other non book items in your collection relating to Lowry? Well, of course, there's some music and uh, um, you know, and a poster or two and things like that. But no, I don't have too much else. I can't afford the artwork. I have one piece of artwork which features his cabin, a nice piece, his cabin at Dollarton, and um, and that's it. But I don't have uh, and the manuscripts, of course, and that's it. So no, otherwise no. I want to say, if I could, a bit more about La Cartanera. Uh, it's almost a cooperative. The idea started in Argentina. And these sort of similar cooperatives, usually with a usually with a strongly leftist bent, a social conscience bent, um, uh, sprung up throughout most countries in South America now. In the, into Mexico, there's several in Mexico, and I think there's one in the states somewhere. And they do these things, um, these sort of book object type things. The interior of the book, of course, is a perfectly serious scholarly collection of papers to do with Malcolm Lowry. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a fun thing; it's a fun thing and with it's a uh, fun stuff it's a fun cover for a scholar collection of papers mm -hmm. and they don't do too many of these things they sell them at cost and uh, uh, and kick back some of the money to the artists of course and they try and cover their costs and uh, try and do more books they've done all sorts of stuff uh, these guys have and the South Americans have done many many of these things it's an interesting idea mm -hmm. and I'd like to see one here have you did you find out about that kind of movement uh, through through the academic circles or how, how did you how did you get to find those copies? Well, this, these ones I found about uh, through my friend uh, and Lowry lover uh, Cheryl Saloom, who may or may not be here. And uh, but um, um, but I knew that this was happening through I knew the conference and the publication was coming out through my friend Foxcroft in England. Malcolm's a uh, Lowry scholar. So both through Lowry collectors, Lowry lovers, and um, and the academic connections. Now we, we have a question here that's come in. We have a couple of questions, but we'll, we'll start with this first one. Um, and you sort of touched on this with with Anne Yandel's uh, dedicated work for UBC to to place materials, manuscript and and print materials of Lowry in the University of British Columbia's collection. Um, are there any other uh, holdings uh, internationally that you know of that are that are really strong in Lowry material? There's quite a few. I think uh, part of U of T, there's a pretty good collection there that somebody put together and sold to University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Huntington Library has got a couple of, uh, I gather, unique pieces in there. Uh, and I think they've got the Conrad Aiken papers. Mm -hmm. So there'll be Lowry stuff in there, Lowry papers. And I think uh, many scholars now, some scholars now, that the UBC collection seems to be a bit in disarray. Last time I was out there trying to find something, they couldn't find it, uh, despite the fact it was listed there. So it needs some needs a bit of energy put into reorganizing that. And some of the people, the non-Canadian scholars, I think are starting to send them material to Liverpool, uh, where Lowry is from. Um, so, um, but there, there's other good ones too. I don't know of any, too many in private hands, but um, there's not there's not a chat group or a Facebook group devoted to Lowry collectors or anything that I know of um, at all. And looking at his life too, I mean, it, it seems like the traveling that was taking place too, we had a, quite an itinerant um, situation at times. It, I, I imagine things kind of spread out a bit uh, or was he, you know, I, I noticed that letter that you that you have in your collection where it comments about 
you know, you could sell this letter at some point. There's clearly an awareness of, of, a, of a development of a, of a figure, you know, a sort of value there. Was, were there any kind of concerted efforts to try and get his working manuscripts together at any point that you know of? Yeah, Marjorie uh, preserved the things mm -hmm. after his death. Okay. Uh, he preserved those, it was interesting. And eventually they went to UBC. Uh, Earl Burney had access to the poems and Earl Burney and, uh, and the Lowry's were friends. And so there is a good nucleus there. And then of course, other material was, I think some was also salvaged from the shack by some of the beach people and some of them went there. Uh, he had other people like Phil and Hilda Thomas, who were good friends of his. And uh, Hilda Thomas was a lecturer at UBC in English, and Phil Thomas collected BC folk songs. And they had Lowry material, and that went there, and others as well. So uh, went there, but I think that's probably the best collection uh, in, in the world, as far as I know. Uh, I'm sure as far as a lot of the first editions, things like the Bodleian and um, Others will have it, but there's one really other really interesting thing. I mentioned that a manuscript of uh, in Ballast to the White Sea was destroyed in the fire, and it was indeed. But what Lowry probably forgot or forgot to mention, and Marjorie never knew, but that was largely written when he was with his first wife, and they split. And he had given a copy of the manuscript, probably for safekeeping, um, to his first wife's mother, so to his ex-mother-in-law. And the Jan Gabriel papers and this manuscript sat in the New York Public Library archives forever uh, until Jan died and they're made available. And her book was published based on some of those things. And But she never mentioned this thing. And eventually Lowry's biographer tracked this stuff down and it turned out there's a, a, a good manuscript of In Ballast to the White Sea sitting there in New York all these years. And Lowry had always said how his manuscript was lost and this business of lost, uh, loss of his shack, loss of his manuscripts and just general loss in Lowry's life. Um, uh, it's a common theme in there. And I don't know whether he knew the, the manuscript was there or, or he'd forgotten it. He had a phenomenal memory. He, he read everything and he had, somebody said it was photographic. I don't think photographed memories per se exist or you're gonna be looking at raster images, nothing searchable. Um, like looking at, trying to, trying to read stuff in a, in a JPEG, but he certainly had a phenomenal memory. So well, I think he, he might have just suppressed that he had this thing there. Mm. That book has now been published. Oh, which I was gonna ask if, if mm -hmm. so that's been, uh, and that was more recently I'd imagine. Yeah, it came out in 2018, 2017, 16, something like that. Great. All those manuscripts have now been published. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that's fit to publish. Yeah. We have another question here, and, and, and this sort of ties into something that I was thinking about as well. Um, you know, you were showing that advanced, that advanced proof, uh, quite a unique item. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Are, what are some objects in your collection that you, you sort of have really galvanized you as realizing you were a Lowry collector? When, when, did, when did you start to realize, oh, this is getting pretty serious? <laughs> Years ago, my wife gave me uh, a first, first edition, first printing copy of Under the Volcano, mm -hmm. which I think she actually got from Bill Hoffer, gave it to me as a Christmas present. It was a, it was a not very good copy at all. And the dust jacket's uh, really ratty and things like that, but it's a copy and it served for many years before I could have before I could afford to upgrade to the thing. And so I think that must have been the 80s, but even earlier, uh, the earliest thing I have that I can trace to it is for my 29th birthday, when my parents gave me a book of essays and some Lowry material edited by George Wood Woodcock, published by UBC Press. And Woodcock was an admirer of Lowry's and did his own work in Lowry and published things by him. And uh, anyway, my parents found this, forgot, gave this copy of book to me and it's dated on my 29th birthday in there. So I think from age 29 till whatever I am now, so it's a good half century that I've considered myself a collector in some fashion within my means. So uh, now of course I've got more money. I'm, I'm a little above the age paperback stage, but uh, I'm not really in the big times with five figure, five figure stuff, can't do it. So, um, but so I've been a Lowry collector for years and reader. Yeah. You were mentioning uh, that there's not been, although there is that group that are doing some interesting publishing in, in South America, you that have kind of a, a leftist political um, 
focus in the way they're doing things. Uh, you mentioned that they're not really, there hasn't been much publishing on, on the Marxist uh, writing of Lowry. Uh, was this sort of political statement writing or were they short stories that were set in a, a sort of social realist approach or what, what, what's the nature of some of that material? I think Lowry was at, at heart probably uh, a democratic socialist. He, he certainly sympathized with, um, uh, with the Republican cause in Spain. Um, he had no track with the Nazis, of course, and I don't think he had any use for the, for the he had no use for the communist regime either. Um, but uh, it, it's just an undercurrent, this Marxist undercurrent runs through some of his writings. It's in Volcano and in quite a few of his other things. Uh, he didn't write tracks or he wrote very few essays um, at all, but uh, he wrote a nice book review of Earl Burney's um, um, first novel, Turvey, uh, which appeared in an undergrad magazine at UBC uh, for his third undergrad publication. And uh, Earl Burney, of course, had Marxist tendencies too. Mm -hmm. So he just seemed to move in those circles. But I don't think he was particularly politically motivated himself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he ever voted in any election or not. Um, you were, people, are, people are starting up, one or two people are starting to follow up, you know, look at look at this in a little more detail than it has, you know, at the Marxist connections. It may have been done before. I'm not totally up in all the scholarly literature. Right. When we were when we were uh, preparing for this this talk, we, we were talking about the variety of different ways Lowry comes up in popular culture, and you showed some of those examples as well. But wh why do you think he keeps <laughs> rearing his head, popping up in different uh, manifestations. Uh, what, what do you think it is? It's not just the kind of the, the drinking element of it. It seems to be a lot of different facets. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on some of that? I, I think there sort of turned out to be sort of a, a legend about his life. And he was always, uh, he was never one to play that down. He was very well aware of that. So he sort of overplayed perhaps the stories about his sieve trips and things like that. And uh, there's a bit of, you know, confabulation and uh, uh, on some of the, his stories and things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he was not one to sell himself too short in that, but he did, a, it was an interesting life and whether you could call it tragic or not, I don't know, but uh, whether you could talk, call it tragic or not, I don't, I think the ending is tragic. Uh, you know, his last half dozen years were certainly tragic uh, there, but on the whole, I think, he had a good life mm. and he was aware of his shortcomings. He was aware of his alcoholism. He didn't until very late in the game, made no real efforts to beat it um, uh, at all. But he did check into Bellevue Hospital in New York City when he was there for a two week stay, voluntarily checked in to try and get the detox thing going. But I think it's just, uh, there's some sort of mis mis mystique about him uh, that uh, you know some people have. You know, and some people don't have. And plus the fact, I think his books deal with loss. Uh, they deal with, with wanderings and voyages and things that perhaps a lot of us wanted to do when we were young and never did do if, or we did, uh, whatever the case may be. And uh, um, they, they deal with so many things. And the more you read his work, the more that there's in it, you know, if, if you want Christian symbolism, you'll, you'll find it in there, just like you will in Herman Melville. Um, You'll, you'll find it in there. You'll find whatever you want in his books. Uh, Volcano is a very, very deep book. That's why people going back to it. But if you just read it once, then that's it. And it's an interesting book in that the first chapter is uh, really at the end of the thing. It's written a year after. Uh, the, it's written on the Day of the Dead, one year after uh, the protagonist's death, um, a year earlier, in 1938, I think, something like that. So just at late days of depression, perhaps when the war clouds are gathering. And so people read this thing, they think it makes no sense, and then that's it. But if they read it again, like Anne Yandel did, three or four times, then uh, then I think you start to see, hey, there's something to this. Anyway, that's what happened with me, and it clearly happened with Anne. And I think it happened with Charles Saloum, who I think might be here or might not, and other people, scholars do. Scholars got lots of things to work on. Well, thank you so much for, for letting us into your collection and your, and your ideas and thoughts about Lowry and, and his history. It was uh, really a fantastic uh, 
expose of it. And um, so I think for for now we will we'll conclude for the evening. But uh, for anyone who who knows anyone interested in in these topics and 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 know that they weren't able to make it this evening, we'll be putting this uh, lecture on YouTube. It will be available. And uh, we, right now the schedule we're just putting it together for the Alcuin's 2022 virtual uh, lecture series, but we do have some solidified dates uh, coming up. April 21st, Chester Grisky uh, will be in conversation with Will Reuter of uh, Aliquando Press. So we're really looking forward to that uh, session. And then May 26th, uh, George Walker will be giving a presentation. So um, stay on the, our site as well as our social media platforms and uh, we'll be announcing uh, registrations for that as well as other uh, other things that we'll have on the schedule for 2022. But um, again, thank you very much and, and a collective thank you to Glenn for this evening for putting together this talk and, and, and the, uh, the images of your collection. It was really, really a pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you. Everyone have a good evening. You too.